Uh, okay. So I would like to start with some acknowledgement. Um, of course, the first acknowledgement to, to Costas Gullias uh, for organizing this, uh, this conference. Uh, it promised to be another great IITBR conference, and I see how many people, it's amazing. Um, and then, of course, thanks for inviting me here to give a speech. I'm uh, truly honored to be your chair. I'm saying to the chair of this uh, association. It was a great pleasure when uh, I was voted, and really pleasure to be here and to um, give this, welcome you, you in this uh, conference. Um, I'll let, uh, like Costas, uh, you can see we haven't to talk about the presentation because I also would like to thank uh, all the ITBR uh, officers and the board members. I've been, I, the first conference was, for me was 2003, and, uh, but I've been involved in the organization since uh, 2010 as a board member. And in these eight years, I really had the pleasure to work with great colleagues, great friends, great people in all sense. So uh, me too, I would like to uh, thank everybody, uh, the officer and the board member. I would like to mention uh, the current officer, uh, Pat Mokhtarian, Costas Gulias, Abdul Pinjari, all the uh, board members, I would like to name them, Charisma uh, Chonduri, Juni Zhang, Matthew Rorda, Ricardo Daziano, Yuzak uh, Suzilo, and also the previous officer, because I mean, bef before uh, I was a chair, I, I became chair, I also was uh, treasurer, secret secretary and treasurer, and so I had the pleasure to work with other colleagues, uh, Joram Shifton, who is here, Juan de Dios Ortuzar and Harry Timmermans, and Ram Pendiala, who is uh, or is uh, there to help us with a historic memory of the association. These are the people I had the pleasure to work directly, but please, if you have not done so, do so uh, go to the website of the association and read all the great people who have contributed to this uh, society. And finally, I would like to thank all of you, of course, because uh, you are the reason why we exist. We exist as an association, and we exist this conference, and the reason why we are so successful. successful. So thanks uh, to everybody. Um, as you see, I mean, 45 years, because the conference, the first one was uh, in 1973. Uh, this is the 15 IATBR conference, but I discovered that two cases were not without numbers, so actually it's the 19 uh, time, the 17 time uh, we have this, uh, this conference. And I discovered that the word research appeared somehow in 91, before we were only International Association for Travel Behavior, not research. So somehow in 91, we added that we also do research. And in 87, I discovered the chairman was the president, not, uh, not the chairman, but it's okay. That's uh, just uh, some note. Um, Costas mentioned how many uh, delegates today. Um, I don't have the numbers for uh, since the 73, absolutely, but uh, the number I have from 2006 to now, to now you can see that uh, the number of members has increased uh, constantly, uh, regularly. Overall, uh, in these uh, 12 years, we had like 700 participants, it means people, I mean, of course, some of us came uh, to all the conferences, so we only count one. Uh, so the community is big, not huge, but uh, is increasing, and the interest for uh, uh, this topic is, is increasing, definitely. In red, what you see is the number of people who only registered for the conference. As you see, you have three years uh, association, but basically, sometimes students who just participate and they go to work somewhere else, or colleagues, sometimes they change topic, and in blue is the total number of members. So, uh, as you can see, more or less, it's like a little bit more than 50% are people who only come for the conference and they, they decide to go for other routes, but there is a bunch of people who participate regularly and uh, along all these years. Uh, this is more or less the same image, but I try to also track, you know, the red is like the people who have been to this conference constantly since at least 2006. So I'm in this red, and many of us are in this red, but there are some people that for some reason, some years could not be participate, etc. So more or less, the conference is really, really important for the association. It accounts for more than 50% of all the entire community, IITBR community. So even more thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, this is just to give you kind of distribution. Of course, the distribution depends on the number of people. US, you are many and great, so you have uh, you know, the highest contribution. It depends on where the conference is organized. Uh, this is, for example, the member distribution for 2018, and means that people registered for um, uh, the UK conference in, um, 
um, in a Windsor. And so, of course, UK, it's a higher participation, but if you look at the, for, um, the years, 2012, 2015, the blue one is the conference in Toronto, and of course, UK participation is a little bit lower, and the Canadian, you know, uh, stand out. But of course, the, there is a variation when you have the conference in your country. It's easier for these people to participate. Uh, but you can see each of you, more or less, the representation in, uh, in this graph. So, um, going back to the research we have been doing in these this years, uh, we have been studying behavior and, in particular, travel behavior. This is our topic. Um, I think this is, at least in my opinion, a very fascinating uh, area of research, extremely important, uh, very complex, uh, difficult to study. Um, in general, there have been amazing advances in different fields, and the IITBR community really contributed significantly to, um, to this area of research. There, we still have ahead lots of research to be done. Uh, it's still uh, understanding and modeling behavior and forecasting behavior is still one of the key research challenges of our time, and they will be also in the, in the future. So it's extremely important, well, I think we all know why, but um, I came across this sentence that um, Albert Camus, uh, Nobel Prize in, uh, for the literature, nothing to do with us, in uh, 1957, he said, life is the sum of all our choices, your choices. What are you doing now? So we are here, so I think we made a great choice, first of all. Um, but this is true, whatever is the decision process behind our choice, it can be very simple or it can be very complex, really the choice and the, the decision process accompany us in every moment of our lives. And we have the privilege to study how people take decisions, how people behave. So I think this is really extremely important area of research that affect human life in all sense. Uh, if you think that in the last um, uh, eight, well, 18 years, we had three Nobel Prizes on this topic. I mean, I think I, I feel I felt privileged, you know, to work uh, in this area where there is so much interest and is so much important, so important to have uh, three Nobel Prize. Um, as I said, it's also extremely complex. Uh, it's not easy to study behavior and to try to understand the modeling. Uh, we, in particular, focus on transport, but we know that. People don't live in a bubble. Uh, people, you know, uh, don't act as if it was completely separated from others. And our behavior is affected by almost everything that is around us. Of course, starting from transport system, because we are working on transport behavior, uh, the urban economic environment, the activity we perform, but even the colleagues we work with, the family, friends, friends of a friend with the network, social network, People, even people we don't know, affect the way we behave, behave in, in, trans, in general and in transport in particular. And not, it's not finished. The information we can receive, it depends. Uh, watching others, either uh, because we want to look at them or because we just copy without thinking, we copy what other people do. And the idea of that we are observed, either we notice that or we don't notice that, everything affects us. And on top of everything, we have the technology. You just mentioned the technology, and of course, from the simple smartphone to the electric vehicle, the autonomous vehicle, vehicle connected, smart city, internet of things, everything is affecting the way people interact and affect the way we move. And it's not finished because this, this system is not static. It, it's a dynamic system, it evolves, evolves over time, it changes, it adapted to the all the new developments that become available, and again, the technology is definitely something that is changing us. You said that life is not changed, but the way we move and the way we interact definitely change. Um, and we need to adjust to that. And there are some people, we have um, a younger member here, who definitely adjust to technology much, much faster than us. Uh, less young people adjust a little bit less. I mean, just quick statistic, uh, UK, for example, 47% of people over 65 years old declare to have a smartphone. Uh, a smartphone is the technology most developed. So, I mean, if you go and say how many times you use internet, the percentage uh, drop. So if we introduce technology in our transport system, definitely there will be a difference uh, depending on the cohort of people, they, um, that's how they react and they adjust to this uh, technology. So um, 
in this complex system that we try to study, uh, so what did we do as a community? Um, I typically don't regret my choice, sorry Casper, but <laughs> I always regret to have this idea to look at what we have done. And the, the reason is almost regret, not so completely. The reason is that we have done too much. Uh, so it was really complicated to summarize, so please excuse if it's not uh, complete. What I've done here, and this is another reason why the book is so important, of course I didn't have access to all the papers you know, uh, that we publish in our community, so I took the book and I saw the, uh, the um, workshop report that were in the book, the papers that were published, and uh, in particular the introduction written by the colleagues who, who organized the, the conference in that time. And um, they highlight, I thought, well, if this is what the community in the Congress highlight as hot topic, then the, this must be the, the important uh, topic in that period of the year. So as you see, I mean, think about all the introduction we mentioned before. Basically, since 1985, all this, we, we have studied and contributed to research in all this field from activity-based, uh, lifestyle, attitude, uh, dynamic issue, technology, 1997, we Hanima Masani is starting talking about technology, and we continue, uh, each conference, uh, this continued to be a hot topic, and this conference, as you said, uh, we saw lots of paper about autonomous vehicles, so definitely uh, an important thing. Social network uh, in 2003 with Kayak 1000, and again, we are talking a lot about social network even now. So, I mean, thinking about how complex is the system, definitely, as a community, we have contributed significantly. Uh, in 1985, uh, the chairman at that time wrote, the main problem with behavioral research on transport is not so much that it's insufficiently advanced, but that it's split into so many different approaches, and in some cases, they don't communicate. And again, we didn't talk before, but <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I think it, this is still true, we have different approach, but what I could have, what I saw, and Costas confirmed uh, with the topic of this conference, there's not any more a lack of intercommunication. Definitely, uh, we have contributed in trying to make all these different approach communicated, completely integrated, and this is something that our community, with our work, has done. And there is another level also of interaction, which is extremely important, is that like among disciplines. Um, I'm not sure if it is the most interdisciplinary, but definitely it's one of the most uh, interdisciplinary field of research. And again, it's not new. This is a sentence from 1997 book from Anima Masani. And I said, uh, through the interaction of all these disciplines, emerge new ideas and new approaches to grapple with the complexity of travel and activity behavior. And this is definitely, again, very, very true. And I think it's something that is distinctive of our community. If there is an area, I think we could we contribute in the developing uh, methods, but especially in trying to integrate the different technology, different methods from different fields, and try to bring a unique, a unified theory of behavior. Uh, there are still lots of challenges I had, as I said before, because our behavior is extremely complex, is affected by everything around us, but it's also affected by what is inside us. Uh, again, we have we, have, we are human, we have a brain, which is uh, complicated. So another layer also of, of uh, interdisciplinarity with neuroscience, for example. And uh, it, it is interesting because I remember where we were discussing the, or criticizing the microconic theory and the critics was, um, we are not perfect machine. And then I read this book from a neuroscientist and he said like, well, the brain is the most perfect machine we can see. Um, I said, well, okay. I think. And, but it actually depends on what you define perfection. Uh, I, mean, the neuro, yeah, I mean, the neuroscientists uh, thought about efficiency. And the idea is that um, we don't produce heat. We don't waste the heat. Our brain does not, does not produce heat. So in terms of efficiency, what we can produce and how much it costs and how much we spend in terms of energy, the brain is one of the most efficient machines. And because of that, the brain computes slowly and softly because any calculation that is fast consumes more energy, uh, is, is as imprecise as possible and compress everything because space consumes energy, even if it's just storage space, and it stays offline as much as possible because any communication means work. So 
we are in this way, actually, not because we are wrong, but because we, are, we need to survive. So the brain needs to adopt all this strategy in order to survive. And uh, this advances in neuroscience actually uh, also affected neuroeconomists. And this is a sentence from uh, Daniel McFadden in an interview he gave in 2014. I said, like, uh, thanks to these new advances in new knowledge about neuroscientists, neuroscience, we were able to explain and give a physiological explanation of some anomalies that psychologists found. Uh, there is also lots of work that, for example, um, explain through the image of how our brain works, the differences between hypothetical choice and real choice, which is something that actually we all face this problem because we all need to collect data in order to estimate our models. So, uh, and then we use very often hypothetical choice uh, or behavior in order to collect this data. And uh, these uh, two, well, not colleagues, but they are neuroscientists, uh, Kammerer and Mobs, uh, they review uh, lots of work on um, neuroscience, and they found that in different areas, of course, uh, that when people make a hypothetical choice, a real choice, uh, the brain activation is completely different. And in particular, in that hypothetical choice, there is smaller the activation of the brain. There are less area that are activated and they are uh, activated with less intensity. And what does it mean? Uh, it means that when we make real choice, there are more function in our brain that uh, pay, um, pay a role. It means that, for example, it's not only um, the trade-off among the characteristics, but it comes to emotion, rewarding, lots of other uh, memories, etc. So this is why there is differences between hypothetical and real choices. And then also tells you that the stimulus that we use when we um, re use a hypothetical experiment is not able to evoke all the functional human responses that we can see uh, they are present in a uh, natural uh, context. And this is interesting because they made the same experiment with non-choice based um, action and the differences is only for choices. So definitely when we make choice, our brain is much more involved and when we don't make, uh, we, we, we behave but with a non-choice, uh, then there are less difference in, in the brain. And uh, they analyzed several aspects, for example, but um, some, some of them is about really uh, choice for product. Um, and we know that we all experience that when we have an hypothetical uh, study and people make choice, they always overstate the probability to choose a product, always. And of course, there are different reasons. And again, they prove that the really that our brain is activated in a different ways. And as I said before, there are different areas and much, many more areas activated when we make an, a real choice. And the reason, for example, is that when we make a real choice, we have, for example, this expectation of really owning the product, taste the product, that for even if the stimulus is really real or realistic, if we don't think that we are going to have process of the product, all these other um, circuitry in our brain are not activated. So uh, this is something that then we will see can help us in understanding why, how we make a choice, and then we can might also uh, help us in try to um, uh, model and forecast the choice better. Um, there is also, for example, the visual working memory, which means that when we see something that attracts us, we memorize more things, and these things are really available to make choice. So again, we have more elements to make choice with and more function in our brain that are, uh, that are activated. Um, the reason is like uh, there is a uh, the stimulus, the visual stimulus, for example, um, 2D, uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional, completely activate a different part of our brain. There is also um, the consequences of our choice. So people basically is not able to, um, in hypothetical choice, they, they, we are not able to really make sense of what can be the consequence of our choice. Um, and this is interesting because um, even if the choice is real, but the consequence is not immediate, but delay on time, they found that we process this information as if it was hypothetical. And then I was thinking, we are all trying, my, I'm the first one, I've worked a lot with electric vehicles and try to forecast electric vehicles, and what we do is like, we ask people to make an hypothetical choice, and then we also ask people to make a choice that is delayed on time. So, I mean, 
summation of bias. <laughs> now, in the sense that uh, this is not a critics. I mean, this is the best we can do, but is how, of course, all these studies can help us in understanding uh, that probably we might not be able even to for ever, ever forecast, you know, uh, what people will do in the future because uh, people will, is not able themselves, even if the choice is real, is not able themselves to make choice that they will maintain. And it's not because we are inconsistent, just because we are not able to figure out all the consequences now. Um, we, have, we said that since 2003, we are talking a lot about social interaction, social network, and again, we use very often hypothetical context, but see the face of a person and all the expression that we can make, again, our brain works in a completely different ways. So I think all these uh, results really um, help us a lot in understanding not so much the, bias, the mistake we are making, we know that we are making mistakes, not easy, etc. but um, more how can we improve, uh, and sometimes that probably we are doing good because there's not much more we can do, to forecast perfectly something that is going to happen in the future. So we can use in both ways to be happy and to challenge ourselves to do definitely much better. So um, what we can do again, of course, definitely if we measure real choices, that's the best we can do, but in some cases like innovation, we can try, but it's not exactly uh, the same, or sometimes many of, very often we don't have available you know, the innovation to test or test in a larger scale. Uh, we definitely can improve all the experiments we have. For example, I've been working on social conformity and instead of presenting an image, I can try to have, they call spectatorial approach, which means you really hear the voice of someone. And again, a real voice, a real face, change the way you perceive, respondents perceive the information they are receiving. So definitely we, we have, um, we can um, learn from this research and try to improve what we are doing. Uh, at the same time, some of this research was able to measure the, mis the, the bias. So we can also use these measurements to correct a posteriori our results. So for example, they measure the willingness to pay for a hypothetical and real choice, and they discovered that there was a bias of approximately 50%, it depends on the experiments they made. So, and if we know that, we can correct. We say, okay, at least we have a measure. We know that we, make some, we have some bias, but we don't know the entity of this bias. Uh, and some approach, I mean, a little bit more extreme, and uh, it's called brain as a predictor. We don't need any model. I mean, if we um, expose people to a stimulus and we see which area of the brain are activated, we can make a prediction out of that. So we don't need us anymore now, no joking. But uh, the problem with neuroscience is, of course, they, they are experimenting with very simple choices. And what we, the challenge, extra challenge we have is that our choices are very, very complex, extremely complex. So we don't have simply... Uh, glass of water or, you know, empty or full, you know, that's the kind of experiment people in neuroscience uh, perform. And when you take this behavior in real life, uh, like the one we, we, we deal with, it's really, of course, everything much more complex, but it really helps us um, to understand better uh, behavior and how to model them. So. Having said that, uh, I come back to my first slides, saying that, of course, this is just an example, an example of everything, the work, the great work we have been doing, and also the challenge that are, um, we face in, in the future. Um, as I said before, I think it's very fascinating and uh, stimulating to see how much we can still uh, do research on and discover, hopefully, and contribute is really, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't like to work in a field where everything is discovered, you know, you, you don't have to do anything. So, of course, it's challenging, sometimes like, ah, too much, but uh, it's what moves human beings, you know, to do more and to do better. Um, I finish with a quote, a sentence of McFadden who says, do not wait for this change to happen, get involved in this research and play a role in making this to come, come true. Uh, enjoy the conference and keep it contributing to travel behavior research. Thanks so much.